Thank you for listening to The Leader. Remember, you can subscribe through your podcast provider to make sure you never miss an episode and tell people about us. You can share us through social media with the hashtag The Leader Podcast. Now, from the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. The world's public enemy number one has a new name. And it is COVID-19. CO, C-O, stands for Corona, you know. V-I stands for virus. D for disease, so COVID. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus from the World Health Organization warns of serious consequences if the outbreak's not contained. We speak to the Evening Standard's Nicholas Cecil about what's being done. Also... Let me say tonight that this victory here is the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. After his New Hampshire primary victory, can Bernie Sanders outlast the Democrat pack to take on Donald Trump? Our US correspondent David Gardner says another candidate is quietly rising. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, COVID-19, the new name for coronavirus. If you want a snapshot of the ripple effect coronavirus, now relabeled COVID-19, is having outside the hospital wards and science labs, take a look at London Fashion Week's launch on Friday. The cameras will still flash, the models will still stride the catwalks, but more than a few of the seats will be vacant. Hundreds of buyers, stylists, journalists and models from China have pulled out. The British Fashion Council is going to give out hand sanitizers, and the venue will be deep cleaned every night. They're also upgrading virtual coverage so those who can't make it can still see the clothes. And that's not a trivial thing. The fashion industry is worth £32 billion to the UK. Coronavirus is threatening to take a chunk of that. Our editorial columns praising the efforts to go on with the show. Fashion already relies on innovation and creativity for success, but the organisers of London Fashion Week are applying these new skills in a fresh way to overcome the challenge of coronavirus. The travel restrictions caused by the disease are expected to prevent the attendance of large numbers of buyers, journalists and stylists, as well as some Chinese models, in what might have been a damaging setback. However, by live-streaming shows and using tech in other ways to show off their wares, London Fashion Week bosses hope to turn the situation to their advantage. It's a clever response that shows once again the brilliance of our fashion industry. Fashions always move fast, but the world only changes slowly too slowly for the World Health Organization. With confirmed cases heading towards 50,000 and more deaths recorded every day, its Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says time is running out for action to stop the spread. We have a window of opportunity now for the rest of the world. We see what's happening in China. If we don't use the window of opportunity we have now, if we don't operate with a sense of urgency, there could be a serious consequence. And I'm reminding the world to use this opportunity to do whatever it can to contain this uh, outbreak. Do everything it can. Well, our deputy political editor, Nicholas Cecil, is keeping up with events in our Westminster office. Nicholas, the health secretary, Matt Hancock, warned the situation will get worse before it gets better. How bad is it? Can it get worse? Well, at the moment, there are certainly a very small number of cases, currently eight confirmed in the UK. We've had an interesting warning from 
a, one, an expert in infectious diseases, uh, Professor Neil Ferguson from Imperial College London. He believes at the moment that a number of cases are getting into Britain undetected. He, he suspects that they're picking up about one in three cases. The Department of Health d disagrees with that, but what both Professor Ferguson and the government do accept is that this coronavirus is likely to spread to some degree in, in the country. So we can expect those figures to go up then? Yes, no, I think that the experts in the government expect the figures to go up. The government say they've got measures in place to deal with it, that there'll be enough hospital capacity and there's strong public health messaging going out at the moment over what steps people should do, which are very similar to what you should do to prevent flu and other such infectious diseases uh, spreading. And that's all advice from the World Health Organization. That's what they're asking countries to do. They've also renamed coronavirus. They've called it COVID-19, which is an unusual name, Nicholas. Why that? Well, the, the virus is actually still called 2019 NCOV. The, the disease itself has actually been renamed, the, the, the symptoms rather than the virus itself. So that the, the disease is now being called COVID-19. The, the World Health Organization does not want these diseases to stigmatize people. Uh, and one obvious concern that if it was, for example, called Wuhan virus, Wuhan is the city in China where the first outbreak started, then obviously the, the people of Wuhan could be stigmatized against. And there are already signs of some degree of racism um, towards Chinese people. For example, there are reports that some people, are, Chinese people are having coronavirus shouted at, at them. So the, the, the health authorities are, are very keen to try and limit such impact of these diseases. One of the consequences of coronavirus, I think, has captured the world's attention is this boat, the, this cruise liner, the Diamond Princess, which is still in quarantine of Japan. I know that you've been covering developments on that one, Nick. Where are those passengers right now? Well, the, the ship is, is docked at Yokohama, and overnight there were 39 new cases confirmed on board, including two more Britons. The passengers who are who test positive for the virus are taken on shore and treated at hospitals. So far, the total of passengers and crew now infected is 175, and that includes one quarantine officer who apparently was um, going around from cabin to cabin doing health check questionnaires, wearing a mask and gloves. But certainly, if he is one of the individuals infected, it shows how quickly this can spread. Next. It is important that Iowa and Nevada have spoken, but look, we need to hear from Nevada and South Carolina and Super Tuesday states and beyond. Joe Biden didn't even stay for the results of the New Hampshire primary. Is the dream of a White House return over for him? Well, at least it went smoothly. The New Hampshire primary votes were all counted on time, unlike in Iowa. And also unlike Iowa, there was a clear winner, Bernie Sanders. With, with victories behind us, popular vote in Iowa and the victory here tonight, we're going to Nevada, we're going to South Carolina, we're going to win those states as well. Pete Buttigieg gave him a run for his money in second place, though with $25 million raised for his campaign last month alone, Mr Sanders has quite a lot of money to run with. Joe Biden, the early favourite for the Democrat nomination, came fifth. So what does that mean? Well, our US correspondent David Garner has been looking at the results, and David, Bernie Sanders' supporters last night seem to feel unstoppable now. Bernie Sanders definitely has momentum after two strong showings in the first two Democratic primaries. The reason that we won tonight in New Hampshire, we won last week in Iowa, <laughs> is because of the hard work of so many volunteers. And let me say tonight that this victory here is the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. 
He has plenty of cash, and cash is king in these contests. He'll be going to Nevada, um, able to spread money around on advertising, push for staffing, making his presence felt. And most importantly, we're heading for Super Tuesday on March 3rd, when Democrats will vote in 14 states. And that takes an enormous amount of money to have a, to have a presence in all those states at the same day. Bernie Sanders has that. He has the support of the left-wing side of the party. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren, his kind of closest philosophical colleague, has fallen back. Uh, so he's alone, really, um, as the left-wing representative, the liberal leader of the field. So that's great news for Bernie Sanders, David. But what about the moderates? Joe Biden didn't even stay for the results, and he came fifth, which is worse than the fourth he was in in Iowa. Is that it then? Is it over for him? Well, not quite, but he definitely did pretty poorly. He will be devastated by the kind of results he got in New Hampshire and Iowa. His big hopes are the fact that those two states were predominantly white. Uh, he claims a strong showing among minorities, and he's already saying that, you know, this is just the start. We just heard from the first two of 50 states. Two of them. Not all the nation, not half the nation, not a quarter of the nation, not 10 percent, two. Two. Now, where I come from, that's the opening bell. 99.9 percent .9 of African Americans and Latinos have not yet had the chance to vote in the Democratic primaries, and he will be hoping that they will be behind him. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. He's certainly struggling for money, which is not a good sign for a former vice president and a guy who would have serious hopes at carrying on the race beyond the summer to take on um, Mr. Trump. Washington Democrats have never been more extreme. Taking their cues from crazy Bernie, the Democrat Party wants to run your health care, but they can't even run a caucus in Iowa. Now, Michael Bloomberg's interesting. He didn't take part in this primary or the one in Iowa, but his campaign still seems to be stepping up a gear. I've seen a lot of social media advertising for him. Americans have roots in every corner of the world, but all of us share a common ancestor. Her name is Liberty. What are his chances now of getting ahead here? Well, uh, he's the, the, the kind of surprise in the race. What can he do? He's the unknown factor. He has stayed above the fray for these first early Democratic primaries. He's planning to come in all guns blazing on Super Tuesday, having spent $300 million of his own money on advertising in those 14 states that will be voting. His credentials, complicated. Um, some suggest he's more a Republican than a Democrat, but he undoubtedly has the money. And as we've said before, money is so important in these races. A lot depends on whether Bernie Sanders can maintain the momentum and whether Mike Bloomberg can break in in a big way and really catch the public's imagination. It's all pointing to a long and exhausting campaign. Two people dropped out yesterday. We'll have to see as we go who has the money and the stamina um, to make it to become the number one candidate, the only candidate to take on Donald Trump. And that's the leader. Take a listen to our audio news bulletins on your smart speaker. There's a new one at 7 every morning with all of the overnight news and a preview of the day ahead. It'll set you up for the morning. Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. And we'll be here with this podcast to make sense of it all in the afternoon. Join us again tomorrow at 4.00. <laughs>